everyone and a heartfelt welcome to one and all we are grateful to all the industry experts for joining us today for this all important discussion leadership think tough staying ahead of the curve presented by service now and in morphis the topic of today's discussion is striking a balance between data and security and this initiative is powered by pro mfg media on one hand data is a valuable asset that can drive business insights innovation and decision making on the other hand ensuring the security of this data is essential to protect it from unauthorized access breaches and misuse achieving the right balance between data and security requires ongoing effort and collaboration across all levels of the organization it is a delicate process that involves protecting data without in hindering its usability for legitimate purposes leadership think turf is a knowledge platform which we have created is designed to learn from the accomplished leaders like you our goal is to access your experiences perspective and comprehensive understanding of the best practices that drive success so once again a warm welcome and i would like to call upon zeeshan the specialist security advisory consultant from service now so just to give a brief already the brief has been given by samya uh i'll just start with an interactive question here how many of you believe that service now has a security solution or there is something about security anybody anybody has an idea anybody things that service okay how many of you know that service now is only an idsm solution so you think that way right <laughs> and that's fair that's fair i have no i have no <laughs> second thought about it but as what uh, surya rightly mentioned uh, today we are going to talk about we have the platform service now has a platform which is a now platform on which we build the entire module system one of the module system that what we have spoken and what itsm that is the service management or operation management is but on that also we are into security now so we have a security module uh, on the platform and today we are going to talk about it in the next 20 minutes what this particular a uh, module is all about how does service now serves into the security arena of things how we help and with the topic that what we have the data and security how do we merge that particular part so i think so today we see before i start we all see data coming from across right uh, we have data from various uh, security solutions non security solutions and how do we build the response cycle to it that is what we are going to talk about it in today's uh, presentation for the next 20 minutes that what we have so as we begin that is what the session will be uh, we'll state the value of what security operations is for customers why it is necessary today uh learn what is secops from service now side and why it is needed and then know more into the details about what does sir and vr stand for so i'll keep the nomenclature right now i'm not going to give you the full form right now uh, and and we'll as we go ahead we'll we'll brief about each and every topic that what we have so why service now security operations so we see every minute of the day this is like i think so every security operation guys or security cyber defend guys or cyber security guys would be talking about it we see attack surface increasing on day by day we see a lot of data in terms of attack surface detections uh malicious content is been acting upon on day to day basis and so we see a lot of alerts but what do we do by alerts are we keeping this alerts to ourselves are we acting upon these alerts is there any response mechanism towards this alerts that is what we want to know about having alerts is good if i get to know i take this as a as a analogy if i get to know that there's a bomb in this building which is good i have got to know that there is a risk associated with it but i don't have that much of evacuation time to save our lives and that is why i need to have a response cycle in that place to make sure that i save all lives and that is what is important just just knowing that there's a bomb inside the building is not going to do good work yeah it's giving me that uh that that idea that what i need to do but i need to have a plan to resolve it in a timely manner 
and that is what we want to bring it on the table. So that is what we see. We see almost 6 billion, and today digital transformation is in full score. So we see 6 billion number of internet users. So out of the 8 billion people that what we have is in population, and if we remove children out of it, that means there is a lot of people who are on internet users. 2017, global internet web and spend surpass TV had spent. So this is a lot of uh, things that what we see on digitalization part. So this is where the spending is. And today, we see a lot of cloud spending. Everybody is spending on cloud, whether it is a private cloud, a public cloud, and so on and so forth. So coming to, again, one more thing. For response to happen, for whom do you need? You need cybersecurity persons. They are the worst, biggest one, because if they don't, they are not there along with you, or you don't have any tool that would help them, they are not going to get that response cycle in a timely manner. They would be still searching. So if, again, same analogy. If I'm a cybersecurity personnel, and if I want to come and find across where the bomb is, I need the direction to first identify. I need what is the timeline that I have to uh, evacuate this place? What is the timeline I have to diffuse that thing, these are the questions that come to me as an analyst. Am I trying to do that today? And that is where I want some quick professionals who can help me to do that, or there has to be a tool who can make my life easier, who can take me to that resolution point quickly, rather than I doing a trial and error method here and there. So coming to what it is. So this is what I feel. There would be wrecking havocs like malware, DDoS, viruses, so I have just put across uh, to make it a little bit funnier that he's the, he, these are the jokers of, of the film world, right? They are the ones who just keep wanting to nag you to find across who are the target, where I could get certain type of money. Then the, cyber, then the attack surface increased. It came to, okay, ransomware, crypto locker, wanna cry. They're the godfathers today because they are trying to ask for ransom, right? That's how they do. And then we moved to spear phishing, so data breach. It was more targeted attacks. So that's why I associated Ocean's Eleven movie, because they target the date, the name of the hotel, the, or the casino that they want to take in. That's how they put the targeted attack. They, they put it that way. And today we see a lot of social engineering. So today now, WhatsApp University is the university that everybody learns from. Whether it is good, bad, we don't know, but that is how it is. So. That's where the misdirection is, and that's why I put matrix. That's where the entire broadcasting helps in. How many of you are able to see security products here? Can anybody name it? It has everything, endpoint, uh, SIEMs, infrastructure, application, and I think so all of you would be using this today. And what does it give? It gives only data. It gives you data to act, but it doesn't help you to act. It would do a protection, I'm not saying no. But due to protection also, everybody goes through a response or have a kind of an incident, which could be an incident of anything. I think so I also get breached. There are people who get breached. People don't say that they get breached, but they do get breached in some or the other way. And what is the reason behind it? And it, it is the most silliest human error also that you will see that the reason behind to get breached. Because not necessarily though I have so many products, but I still want to make it as a convenience factor after having so many security products to make my employees work within my environment and from anywhere and from wherever they can today. After COVID, we have learned that if I'm sitting at home, I still want to have access to my data and there might be restrictions put across this, but if I have to give him that data, I have to open up certain ports, certain channels for him and that at times remain unseen and that is where the hacker tries to breach in and do come in and create an incident. So how do we see that particular part? And it could happen to anybody. It cannot be only to one, one department or it cannot happen to only the CISOs, CIOs, or CTOs. It can happen to anybody. So that is a broad way to look across things. It can happen to any asset. It can happen to any user. It can happen to any application that you have today within your ecosystem. It could be an entry point for that attacker to move in and then he would look at his target once he is inside the network. So that is where the agility, integration are the new imperatives that I feel that we want to work as a collaborative force rather than working in a silo force. So this is where 
how does security operations help? It first and uh, most important thing, it helps you to answer basic questions. Who did the attack? Where did it happen? When did it happen? How did it happen? If I'm an now imagine if I'm the analyst, my first question, if you are a, all are CISOs here, right? If I tell you that there's an attack that has happened, the first question that would come to me, we have so many security solutions, where did it breached? How did it breached? And that is why I need a faster answer to give you. Rather than I going back and doing a research, I would see the tool that would help me who's able to give me this first point of answers. Then I want to see combined responsibilities of IT operations and security operations. Okay, you've created that alert, but I want to go to the remediation back to the ID team. And that is where the ID team should be able to help me out to make that remediation task easier. And then it has to be in an automated and a time effective part. So we'll go into what is that what we offer. So we offer two sites here in the security operations side. The blue one is where the respond to the incident. So this is more like a reactive approach that you would take, where the incident has happened, and how do you make sure that that incident get covered from the organization point of view in the most timely and effective manner. So that is what when I said I'll give you the full form. The SIR means the security incident response. So we'll go into detail that how this works. And the second part is on the more proactive side where you're doing scanning across your network, and that network could be anything. It would be IT assets, it could be web applications, it could be cloud security, it could be OT devices, IoT devices, servers, network devices, whatever you do to find across what is the weakness that you have. And once you have the vulnerabilities, that is what is weaknesses are, you want to fine tune and look across that which is at maximum risk for me. And that is where the response cycle comes in. So if I break this, today we have the security ops center that is the security incident lifecycle management which includes the ops center and the major security incident. If you have DLP attacks also, we take care of the DLP responses as well. And today we have in the roadmap, but I would say that I'll keep the roadmap for another two months, we will have the cyber fraud attack. How do you respond to that as well? And the next year we'll see on the physical security part as well. So typically when you see uh, webcams or CCTV frauds that happen, we'll see how to respond to that as well. So these are, these are the uh, 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 modules that what we have within the SIR part. And on the vulnerability lifecycle, whether it is application vulnerability, OT, software ch supply chain, cloud security, misconfigurations, infrastructure vulnerabilities, we cover everything under the same platform. So you don't need to look across multiple platforms within. You might be using multiple scanners, but it is coming onto a single platform. And what does all this gives you? It gives you two things, four, four things. First and foremost is visibility in terms of the number of incidents dedicated to security. It gives you what are the vulnerabilities that you have and that comes as a direct ingestion from your scanners and it does, second part is on prioritization. And the prioritization is not just because of a global exploit. It's going to exploit globally, that's why I will put it on prioritization. It gives prioritization on the basis of business contextuality. And third is it gives you collaborative workflow because finally ServiceNow is a workflow company. It helps you to build that workflow that how do you make it resolve in the most easiest manner most automated manner. So now we have the next generative AI which we have put across that helps you to assign it to the right side of people, patch it, orchestrate the patch, help you to gain that faster and in the most time, time effective manner. And finally, the dashboarding. Today, the dashboarding is the most important factor because if you're looking across an auditor to come and help you out and ask him why you've done this, what was the reason behind it, where did it come from, the questions that was put up earlier, that helps you to put the track performance across the organization. So this is how it looks like. So if you look across the first part, on the detection side and the correlation side, the SIR, we ingest data from all the SIMs today. So you have standard SIMs like Palo Alto uh, or Splunk, 
Oxide, McAfee, uh, Securonix, Microsoft Sentinel, we integrate directly today. So we, these all integrations are out of box. Similarly with vulnerability, we integrate with all the scanners, whether it is IT asset scanners like Rapid7, Tenable, Qualys, application scanners like Veracode, Podify, uh, container security scanners like Burpsuit, or even for cloud scanners that you are using, uh, check marks or Acunetics that what you have in the market. These are all today directly integrable, so there is no need to have any parser. And it comes onto the, on the ServiceNow platform. The ServiceNow platform helps you to do the prioritization. Now what is the prioritization here? Is the prioritization anything different from these two guys? Because I have invested into SIM. I have invested into the vulnerability manager. They give me prioritization, and why should I look at your prioritization? And this is exactly what is differentiator here is, if I have to understand that among the five critical incidents or five critical vulnerabilities that I have, which one is the most critical? Which one will make my security posture get better? Which one will make my risk get lowered? That is what I need to understand. And how does it help? It helps you to identify what will be the impact. It gives you a risk score directly. That's again an automated response that what we have. And it lets you know that what is the score of the asset in terms of risk associated to it. So this gives you a complete cycle to understand that how I need to prioritize my incident whether it is a vulnerability incident or a security reactive incident that what we see. So this is the value that it brings in. Once we have that, the analytics, the ML helps you to put across the assignment onto the right set of people, create the patch orchestration. So we can integrate with all the uh, uh, security products that what we have. So we act as a SOAR here. So this particular part when we talk about SIR, SIR is actually the SOAR capability feature that what we have which will bring the automation to reduce your incidents in real time. Second, it has playbooks. So the playbooks helps you to understand what are the steps that you need to take in terms of resolving the incident in a quicker time. So it's an automated process again. So now as an analyst where my questions were why did it happen, what was the reason, I'm able to get that much, much easier. And also, this particular part helps you to understand whether the incident or the vulnerability that has happened, is it a true positive incident or a false positive incident? So we help you in terms of integrating with third, third party threat intel platforms like recorded future, anomaly detection, virus total scan, and give you a complete picture of whether that incident is a true incident or a false incident. So this is the workflow that what we have. What does it do? It helps to mitigate the impact of an attack, secure the overall organization in a more coordinated manner, utilize efficiently utilize manpower tools and resources, and the last part is more important. It includes SOAR and threat intelligence, which is a part of the solution today. So what does it do? It brings you on a single pane of window to understand the stuff much, much easier. This is the response cycle. We integrate with SIMs, prioritize the security incident, give you the triaging with the threat intel where we help you to identify whether it is a true positive or false positive, and then this 4A and 4B helps you to do the analysis part first, where the role of the analyst becomes easier. It helps you to identify that why the incident has happened. That is what we call the analysis part, and the V part is more across on containment and eradication, where the response so let's take a simple example here. If I have a phishing attack that I report to my SIRT team, it comes as a phishing attack. I want to understand whether this phishing attack is a true phishing attack or not. This particular guys will be able to help me to find across where the domain is, what is the body, contains any malicious content within my email. If that comes in, I'm able to clearly identify and give you an answer. Yes, it is a malicious website through which the email has come. And then I can clearly make orchestration in terms of deleting all the mails from all the mail servers or mail users that are in my organization and then create a rule at my firewall or an anti-spam stating that this particular URL is a 
blacklisted URL and needs to be blocked if anything reoccurs. The last part is the most important part because every security incident guy needs to close this ticket. And to close this ticket, he needs to put up a forensic analysis or the root cause analysis. And this is where we create that automatically, have a report in a PDF format which he can paste it back to the ticket so that tomorrow if an auditor comes in, he gets a complete gist about what was the security incident, why it happened, what was the reason behind it. So this is another added value that what we have. Similarly is for IT security vulnerability response. You have vulnerabilities, you need to uh, patch them in a timely manner. Patching is not so easy. It takes a lot of time because you have to test it. Sometimes it is uh, the servers or the assets are unavailable. You need to take exceptions. How do we manage it? So when we see this particular part, again, we see the integration on the left side with all these scanners that what we have. The CMDB helps you to prioritize it. Triaging is same as the SIR, but in both the cases, now the shift is. There you have to analyze it, why it has happened here. It is the weakness that you have, which you have already done a proactive way to find why do I have a weakness within my environment. And then I need to patch it. I can create a patch orchestration directly from the platform. I can create a change request from the platform to patch it. And also if I'm not able to patch it, I can create an exception request on the platform. So today I see a lot of customers using three different products to do this. They have a different patch management server to take a look at the reports. They have a different change management. They have a different exception management. Now just imagine vulnerabilities coming on a scanner report. Then you see an exception tool, you see a change management tool, and you see a, a patch orchestration tool. Four tools for just managing your vulnerabilities. Now that is really crazy. And this is where we bring in the value to have this on a single platform. And it becomes a transparency window for your IT and security operations to look upon. And the final part is if I want to revalidate whether my vulnerabilities are properly been patched, if I want to have a delta report from my previous to now, I can actually initiate a rescan from the platform itself to find across what was identified earlier has been passed or not, and what is the new that I have found. And when I, when I find vulnerabilities or ingest data of vulnerability from the platform, I also do deduplication. When I say duplication is like I remove duplicate vulnerabilities that I have. So I reduce the efficiency in terms of not serving on duplicate vulnerabilities, and obviously the productivity gets better. And also the IT gets to know that there's a reduction of vulnerabilities. So this is what we have on the platform today. So what did we achieve? We see a lot of better efficiency. We see 80% reduction in critical vulnerabilities because deduplication is the key. 85% mean time to contain improvement. And I really say this because we have seen today most of the banking customers using this today we have NSC already using this particular tool and who are seeing the benefits of this. And from seven hours to seven seconds, that is what we want to do. We don't want it to keep identifying where the incident is, why it has happened, what is the reason behind it, and spend time and then do the remediation process. So this is where we bring across uh, the things. So finally, ServiceNow can workflow vulnerabilities and configuration, so today, the key takeaway is we just not an IDSM company, we work on the security aspect of any organization. But we are not into a detection model, we are more into the response model. That is a message that what we want to convey. And we take care of any response that you have from the security side, whether it is an incident response or whether it is a vulnerability response. We care, take care of both the things today or even as a DLP response, that's what we want. And we'll be more than happy for taking that discussions further if you are looking across for certain type of uh, uh, availability that you have within this kind of infrastructure point of view where you can want to build this as an automated service within your organization. So thank you from my side. Any Q&A, Q I'll take it from you. How different is it from SOAR? Uh, it is not different from SOAR, but what we add to the SOAR capability is uh, we just don't want to, to react to a particular incident. 
So we want to have this as a response cycle. So we cover the entire life cycle management and SOAR is one of the capability it has. So when we talk about analysis, what is the analysis behind? Why this thing happened? What was the reason behind it? What is the impact about it? What is the prioritization? So let's take an example. You have similar incidents of same type. The SOAR will not be able to let you know that of the two, which one you need to prioritize upon. That is the first thing that what we bring in. The triaging process, whether it's a true positive or a false positive, that SOAR will not bring upon. Third is the entire analysis part or the post-incident review part. That again a SOAR can, SOAR will only say, okay, this is the incident, does it match to my playbook? I will just go and resolve it. What was the method behind it? Why did you do that? What made you do that? Those answers are not given. So we add up that value to the SOAR and obviously we compete with all the SOAR that we have in the market today. Yeah, I hope I was able to answer your question. Anybody else? Absolutely, so that's what we call it as, it's a security incident response. In our nomenclature we say it that way, but yes, it is a security analytics uh, that what we do and we help you to understand that why that incident has happened. Any other question? So basically, uh, when we are going to see, like uh, you are yeah. taking some data from them, so are you creating duplication of the data or? Uh, I would not say, we just, we don't make any duplication of data, so we only take from the SIM, what are the security incidents that you have pulled in. So if you want an entire data to come in, it can come as a direct data. If you want only security incidents to be coming in, we can only pull that security incident. If you say that I want to make sure that the critical data comes in, I can go and map and find the critical data and then only I pull in to help you to prioritize. So we can pull in any data that what we have and we don't create deduplication on that. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm generating a thousand of alerts daily. Now I don't know which is the actual incident, which is a false. Now you yeah. have to take all the metadata or actual data behind these alerts. So you have to take the data. Yes, so absolutely. We'll have to. So when we absolutely rightly said, so the alerts that get generated out of SIM, it could be an operational data, it could be a security data, it could be anything. So when we take that data, we do the correlation and create security, only security incidents. And we give back the data. So if you see my slide earlier, it is a two-way uh, traffic that flows from the SIM to the platform. So we only take the security alerts and we create your security incident to make you aware. So today, if, if you look across as a certain factor, certain says that security alert need to be uh, uh, alerted within six hours. That's what you need to report it, right? Okay. That is where we help. Yeah, now it's two hours, yeah. What I had the information was six hours. So that is where we help you to create that alert, report that alert and create incident. And if there are any similar incidents also, so then you can just back that similar incidents to that one parent incident. So we create a parent-child phenomena as well. We don't want your analyst to work on the same ticket again and again, where the incident is similar to what has been reported. So we do that part as well for you. So we find similar security incidents or same security incidents and pack it to that one single ticket. So then as an analyst, I come to know that out of the 10, this is my one ticket that I need to follow and the remaining nine will get resolved automatically. So that is what we do. So, uh, Vishan, one question yeah. is, uh, millions of uh, events are flowing right so yeah. how you are flagging those and do we have a sandboxing capability with this no we don't have a sandboxing capability so okay. we are not doing uh, any alert mechanism as i said okay. the flow of events are very simple mm -hmm. whether it's a vulnerability or whether it's a, ins a security incident okay. we integrate directly with your sims and the scanners okay. to pull that data onto the uh, platform and these integrations are all out of box integrations there are no, uh, there is no need for an API integration because today we see most of the standard integrations that what we have, what we see in market, like in terms of SIMs or mm -hmm. vulnerability, we have uh, more often than not out of box integrations. So it's a part of uh, bundle package or? Yeah, it is part of bu bundle package. So uh -huh. there is no different licensing. The licensing is very simple. One is SIR. If you want to look at your uh, security incident, then you can go ahead and buy SIR. 
and then there is VR, which is vulnerability. And these can be also uh, sold as modules. So SIR module and VR module. And if you want both, then it is a SecOps module, simple. Okay. Do you have the patch management capabilities? So, okay. We don't have a built-in patch management. We don't do patch management on our own, but we can create the patch for you. We, we actually uh, find across what is the patch that is required. The only thing is like you need to have uh, integration with a big fix or SCCM or even like uh, open source products like w WSUS or anything that you have. The only thing is like we orchestrate the patch, but the delivery of the patch is through the patch management process. That's how it is. Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely, sir. Absolutely. So we, so I, I again an analogy I take. We create the food, but finally the delivery is with Swiggy then the matter. Simple. So how will we work on the DLP? DLP. Okay, great question. So DLP in, on DLP incidents, there are two things that what we have. So when you see a DLP incident happening, so that with there's a breach that has happened. So if you want to understand why the breach happened, what was the policy that were kept open, so we can actually go and do an automation in terms of reversing those policies. So let's uh, let's take an example here. If I'm the user, uh, I have actually tried, I'm, it's my last day today, I want to take data along with me, where am I going? I'm, if I'm going to Salesforce, let's say I want to take ServiceNow data along with me. And that is a breach that I'm trying to do, and if, let's say, I know that there is a time where I can still copy my data on USB. And if I do that, then how do I retrieve back? How do can I stop that data to get further breached? That is what we help you. And second use case that comes in is like, if I want to genuinely send data, so like, like, like today itself, I wanted to send this presentation to him. I was not able to connect the USB and put it directly. So I'll have to take a permission, or if by mistakenly I've sent that data to him, it's a human error that happens. Or if I want to open a timeline to send that data for him, so that is a exception that comes in, then you can create that exceptions and approvals on this particular platform itself. So that is what we do on the DLP side. Yeah. Briefly, like I will touch upon one uh, case study. In fact, uh, it has already been implemented because this particular problem statement has been applicable for banks, for uh, stock exchanges, for card processors, where like uh, this is one uh, large implementation which we have done very specifically for a large card processing organization, where they had like almost 200 plus fields which was marked as uh, SPIII. And that is starting from the card numbers to the pin details to the customer demographic information. And with the help of a sensitive private application, uh, they have been able to mark these 200 as SPIA, persisting them locally while still implementing service now across IT workflows, risk workflows, and so on and so forth. And they're expanding it further. And uh, in terms of uh, coverage perspective, it works across data and attachment so that uh, tomorrow if you take a decision that uh, this particular attachment type could potentially carry my SPI information maybe that could be the vendor master dump even that same uh, set of controls could be applied for attachment data as well so I will uh, just play a two minutes video which is just to give you a glimpse of uh, how simple and efficient it is to configure and then we'll move to the exciting part which is the next panel discussion so if you can please play it The first step is to set up the global properties for data localization application. Here on this page, you can set up global properties for the application like database type and failure mechanism for any transaction. This setup is one time. After this, we will select table configuration. In this, we will select the table which have sensitive data. Let's select the sample incident table configuration. Here, we have marked sensitive fields like short description and description. We can also provide additional condition for our configuration to work. Also, let's mark attachment on incident as sensitive. Under table fields configuration tab, we provide configuration like field type and field length for external database where our sensitive information is being saved. 
The last configuration is to provide the database operation enablement. You can select the operation like insert, update, read and all for the marked sensitive fields. As all configurations are saved, let's see it in action. Let's create a new incident. And provide details like color, category as software and put input in short description and description field. Let's submit the record. Here on the list layout, you can see the short description and description field data is empty. This is the proof that data is not saved in ServiceNow database. Let's open this record. Here, we can see the a message appear stating that sensitive data loaded from database. And we can see our short description and description data on the form. To see the sensitive data logs, go to Activity Log tab and click on Show Data button. After clicking, we got the activity details for sensitive marked field. Now let's update the short description and click on update. Now updated value is loaded from database. We can also check the activity log to see updated values captured in logs. Last, let's upload one attachment marked as sensitive for incident table. Once the attachment is uploaded, refresh the form. Click on Load Attachment button, which will open a new screen. Here you can select the uploaded sensitive file and download it. India works with ServiceNow, and Inmorphous works with you. So I think that is it. Thank you so much. We'll quickly move to the next panel discussion. Thank you, Surya. Uh, the time has come for us to uh, begin the panel discussion the CXO leadership think turf, staying ahead of the curve, striking a balance between data and security. Let me uh, set in the context and then of course we would uh, love to hear your thoughts. So I think the context has always been that all the large enterprise organizations, in fact, they have been in their journey of digital transformations, implementing large projects. However, when we talk about digital transformation, I would say one of the fundamental outcomes, which are kind of always taken as prerequisites, has been seamless user experience and seamless access to data. Now, when it comes to seamless experience and seamless access to data, one of the most difficult challenge has always been that how do you strike the balance between data and security? And uh, that's where uh, you know we would like to start with. So, we very briefly, you know, we would like to hear your thoughts on what are the key challenges and what are the key considerations which you have in your mind specific to your industry when it comes to striking the balance between data and security. So Ganesh, we can begin with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, actually uh, for me, it's uh, something like uh, data security is uh, not uh, inversely, inversely proportional to the data access. I I think sir, when you implement a uh, good security uh, at your environment, uh, then you can provide uh, access to your customers or the third party or the service uh, services. It actually uh, enables you uh, that you have a certain controls. Now you can freely given access to your uh, provider, service provider, or the uh, the third party or the your partners. So basically, uh, when we talk about the security, uh, it's mostly uh, there are two thing, things. One is the regulations, like uh, we always talk about the regulations or like that. So one thing is the regulations. And when we talk about the regulation, it also has some impacts on the accessibility. For example, GDPR, uh, it talks about data. You have a data minimization, the, uh, some restriction over the sharing, it limits you. And the second thing, uh, the best practices, no doubt, uh, which we follow that uh, from the industry experts, where, what we hear from each other, we implement that controls. But mostly what I feel that once you have a certain kind of controls, once you have a certain kind of things in place, uh, for example, you have defined a framework, you defined your data, you have classified your data, which is more critical for us, which is not, which is public, which is private. Once you define that, then you have that uh, you have put some controls that to whom should I give an access to what kind of access I can give. You have defined all the things. Now only the thing is that you need to provide the access. Now when you have given the access to uh, your partners, now you can freely give access to them. You assure that okay, my confidential data is secure. 
because I have restricted that access. But whatever data is required for the partner, I'm freely able to provide because I have a security controls uh, in place. I have a uh, uh, necessary framework in place. So uh, I think uh, data security is uh, uh, proportional to the data accessibility, not the inverse. And it enables you to freely share data uh, with your partners. Uh, and it relieves your pressures as a CISO or a security leader. It relieves your pressure that, okay, now my uh, confidential data or my essential data is secure. And whatever data is required partner, I can freely give to uh, our uh, partners. Yeah. Based on that, data is generated. And that data comes to the organization. And that same data is distributed to the various business partners, various clients and internally through one uh, through one medium or the other medium. So yes, we need to secure data. There are tools available for securing data. But what are we doing for securing information which should not flow out of the system? That is a critical question which I'm, I have no answer as of today. I don't know whether how many people will have answered for of that question sitting here in this forum. So let us keep that information uh, piece on the side and let's focus on the data only. Yes, we need to secure and there are tools available. But as we say, our chain is as strong as its weakest link. So what is the weakest link in this? It is all of us, all human beings or all employees of the organization or everyone who is associated with the with the business cycle of the organization so we so our focus should be to ensure that the weakest link becomes stronger and stronger so in the entire so in this uh, process entire chain becomes stronger gains strength to strength so i have been taking i have been presenting in capital market it's a mandatory requirement on an annual basis for security awareness to the business associates and employees of the organization. So we keep on harping on certain issues in each and every presentation. Uh, so basically from data perspective, I will uh, start with the inventory. So if you have an inventory of your uh, organization, like what data your organization is processing and the information is getting processed, by your organizations or by your impaneled vendors, partners, then you will have at least maximum level of the control. I will not say full control because controlling complete data will not be possible at any point of time, but you will have a maximum level of control. And at the same time, whatever the security levels you have at your gateways. So if you have identified these two controls maximum, so you will have the maximum level of control of your data. <coughs> But still, uh, there is a say that uh, uh, though you have a full control, but still there are chances of breaching the data. And data breaching the thing, but most of it will be, if you will be able to find, it will be from the IT team only. Because who knows what are the loopholes are there and from where I can get the data. So that is where uh, you have to work very collaboratively from the IT team. Because most of the time it happens uh, uh, we work completely opposite from the IT. Like if you will see like security and the IT, they will be completely opposite. If IT says I have to do this, security will say no, we have to do this. So if both the teams can work collaboratively, then I will say most of the issues will get resolved from the data security perspective. And there has to be some kind of like an understanding between both the teams. Like I will say from the maturity perspective, if there is no maturity, then I will say yes, then there is a data at risk for that organization. Definitely. I believe maturity is a journey in itself. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Sure. So because because whenever like if you will sit in the board meetings or in the executive meetings, when there will be a questions comes like who has done what. So whenever good things happens, everyone will wants to put up their names. <laughs> yes, we have done like IT team has done, the CISO has done this, or security team has done this. But whenever something make uh, messed up, no one want to put their name. No, it is because of the IT, it has been done that. And then IT will claim no security team has to check that. That's a security tool. So maturity, security controls. So this has to be taken care. And as I said, initially, inventory has to be the first part. If you have the inventory of your information, 
which is really a tough job depending upon the organization when you talk about data and security that security is your accessibility security is your control mechanism that how you're controlling the things right but data is a gold okay if you're the gold you have to pay the price for that okay or someone wants to steal that gold right so you need to be groom your team yourself as well what he said the 20th problem is that we are not knowing about that uh art of war you are still literally in art of you know is literally in war situation of the virtual you know or uh, world you can say because if you collect the informations from all no a system where the hacks are happen right still the hacking is happening right is happening still continued and you you need to know uh, how to protect the classified informations so people are behind the classified information not all the data okay so first flag your data okay importantly the core financial system or core business system of the any company you need to protect them okay you cannot protect all the employees you cannot protect all the systems okay certain level you will feel that someone already having access to your system okay it depends is a crucial system is a critical system where the classified informations are okay stored so prior to that we had to create some mechanism we had to understand and we had to educate our team that to how to react those situation when we you know uh, clashes between this classified data Uh, is going to out your uh, out of your systems right that we have to understand so it educations awareness uh, is very much important okay and not only for your security professional but is all employee in the your organizations right? they need to aware about it the core issue is in india is they are actually way behind than where we want to take it as a ciso okay we are already you know landed there at maturity level but other people are not so your capability or responsibility is more over to take these people also in that maturity level right that you have to sensitize the data you have to understand what you are talking about okay so the culture that we need to bring it into organization is more important okay for data and security technically we are aware about that we are all mature organization that we do have right we know all these tools and technology will help us okay yeah uh and then importantly we need to no um give educations right on from starting from beginning to our universities to our schools our colleges and then when they in these uh, students are you uh, know having a jobs to the corporate companies they they need to aware about what what is the data is so that's a uh, different story altogether but when try to be a more smart than other person who are actually trying to steal the data okay the core core system should be protected okay where your classified information are stored information your law firms like you like you that you have a you no know, lot of legal informations are there the client information so protecting those informations we need to be you know have a more smart systems more smart people okay more smart processes and all these three need to be integrated okay then we can say that we 80% things are protected uh, one more thing i would like to suggest is develop your sirc okay security incident response not even response command and control also okay nowadays you have to proactively response back to the threat which all uh, you have to neutralize the threat also somewhere okay like you are at no uh, scanning your surfaces attack surfaces your websites are not secure so you are actually scanning the website to remedy it okay so uh, you have to be aware about yourself that what is attack surfaces are okay true true okay So thank you thank you so much in fact uh, i would uh, just take the discussion a little further if you may allow sir i think like uh, one important point is that industry is evolving and perhaps like uh, there are like problems which we are solving uh, which are five year older uh, but definitely time will not stop there would be problems which will come five years ahead with the whole ai ml and all those things triggering in so how do you see that how do we bring in this bridge and then address the whole response part of it while addressing what has been coming to us in the last 5 years versus building a strategy for 5 years ahead i think uh, so when you look at the emerging risks that are there given that ai ml and uh, other forms of developments are on the cards 
I mean, I we already use analytics and ML, and AI also is looking at it uh, because we have we need predictive claims, and I'm in a life insurance company. Predictive claims and predictive persistency for each policy holder. So, uh, and I mean, quite agree with uh, what Atul said that it's a challenge to protect security because uh, day in day out you get cases of attacks and cases of breaches, and how have you tackled it? Despite having the best of the network in terms of all technologies we have already implemented, processes uh, again certified, and uh, technology uh, latest and people are trained and we have an exam 15 uh, questions. When you look at emerging technologies and more to come, when AI beats up the human being also, it's already in many spheres. How do you and then chat GPT. Ideally, everybody would like to access chat GPT, but can I give it freely and how do I? We do have MDM in the mobile, but do I allow chat GPT on the personal side? Of course, I can't monitor that. It's, it's a challenge. And so you would have challenges with all the emerging technologies. And so you need to do continuous risk assessments uh, for every single emerge emerging technology and then look at people process technology, all the three. Upgrade the controls. And uh, we also put up to the board all the six, seven versions. One is the Nani pot, what happened in that. Then we get to know so many countries are attacking you. And then we, how do we privatize those part and how do you drop off? Then we look at SIEM and uh, SOC report. I do a daily VAPT on internet facing application. So that also comes. Then I have two more, I have audits continuously and then risk assessments also continuously. So six zones come to me every day and all this is put up to the board. So there's so many vulnerabilities, medium, high, critical, low. Coming to Akash, I think Akash from the service provider perspective, I would like to ask you one question that there is in security, I would say there has always been a problem of plenty. It's yeah. not that uh, we don't have technology. It's like we have enough, more than enough technology. So how do you see the future of effective response down the line? How it is going to shape up? Coming to your question, uh, Surya. See, before I even tell that how I am going to take that step, I need to put this point in front of everyone that before looking everything from a classic point of view, we need to understand the data point of view as well. Okay. So nowadays we are not just having the structured data. We are having a lot of unstructured data and the issue arises because of the unstructured data, be it in security, be it in analysis and everywhere. It's because of unstructured data because we are generating unstructured data on a rapid scale, like 20 GB in a day, a person, single person, and it's the minimum stats I'm talking about. And when it comes to the structured data, it is very easy to classify. And because it's easy to classify, it is easy to control and we can put the right access measurement. But when it comes to the unstructured data, it's not easy to classify because it's not easy to analyze as well. And that's where I think the AI ML capability will come into the picture because it will help us on to the learnings and the machine capabilities that we can easily or I'll not say the easily one. I'll say that we can at least 70 to 80 percent classify the data and analyze the data and rightly prioritize it because unstructured data is the one and I was reading one report that unstructured data is the one that is putting a lot of points and a lot of pressure to the organization because no one knows from where that data is coming and what the data is holding and how this data is related to other data as well. Now coming from the uh, service provider point of view. So what happened is when we when we work with companies like you, when we implement, let's say, let's take an example for service now, there, there, there are things that start like even before when we start working with you guys, usually there is a third party risk auditor ass assessment, right? And this is one saying that I have uh, picked up from one of the good CTO who has actually mentored me that it is start before it is start. So basically when we opt for a service provider to provide any kind of services. We actually do a lot of third party audit risk 
as well as onboarding how it was happening was that uh, we just onboard the company and after that when uh, there was a tpra requirement then we used to send the questionnaires and they fill it and done that's how even the in today's era many tpra happen but not anymore because until unless we don't take this risk seriously we don't audit this in a serious manner we always will be having a people who will leak the data because people are the biggest mole we people are the biggest mole because if tomorrow my phone is gone anyone can ask, access this one and it's very easy to break the encryption like it happened that it's very easy to even break the fake uh, face recognition even the fingerprint or even the passcode it's easy so third party audit risk is important and then it has to be integrated with the vendor onboarding and after that we need to have a proper vendor risk management because there might be certain fourth party which are working with the service provider and ser its service provider responsibility to provide all these informations so yes definitely all these information are structured but again we need to have certain kind of automated measurement like certain kind of workflow system which remind otherwise tracking it manually is a tedious and tedious task i think on one side you know we have been discussing uh, automation starting from identification to orchestration to soar capabilities and like uh, doing everything in 7 seconds and on the second other side of it you know every organization uh, collaborates with partners vendors contractors and then the fts are there so how do you you know envision that how we bring in that same level of efficiency and while at the same time satisfying the requirements of the regulators which has started yeah. talking about fourth party assessments yeah so yeah uh, in our case yeah uh, coming from the group you know organization where we are you know tightly regulated by sebi so we are in broking business both corporate and retail as well as in the low brokerage internet trading company which is five paisa so we are also an nbfc so tightly regulated by rbi housing finance again rbi and nhp we do also insurance broking then again irda you know as an intermediary clauses you know the guidelines of 2017 2022 2023 mm -hmm. april right so uh, you know surya vendor risk management plays a very important role right uh, you know in you know if you want to primarily not succeed but yeah take that you know security to some maturity level right so uh, as you know sundar rightly mentioned right risk assessment is very very important right so and all the regulations right starting from our gopal krishnan committee guidelines which is 2011 taken ird 2017 take it sebi 2018 then rbi nhp 2000 june 2017 everyone talks about the third party risk management or vendor outsourcing it outsourcing or material whatever you call so uh, vendor risk assessment is must before you onboard the vendor uh, you can't go back to the customer or regulator that if you are breached and you tell that it is done by vendor right so a can entire accountability of the information lies with the organization not with the vendor right so you need to take the entire ownership of the information right so in our process you know so we we have a third party risk management process since last many years before onboarding the vendor we do a required due diligence we ensure that they have an adequate level of controls which will protect our data it starts from your master service agreement so you need to legally bind the vendor first right after that there has to be continuous audit when i say continuous so we in our case because at the group level we have large you know number of vendors right so a critical vendor needs to be reaudited every year non critical once in two years the reports of the vendor risk management as sundar said right all also go to the board right so gone were the days where board were non technical they did not understand cyber security right so we we represent boards i'm part of risk management audit committee it strategy it committee cyber right mm -hmm. board members ask these kind like kind of questions they are well aware what is ransomware what is mm -hmm. data breach what is hacking they may not be technically you know knowing this but they said that do we have a comfort and he, as you rightly said that we also say that today and tomorrow we will be breached but rbi says sebi says ird we need to be cyber resilient now not cyber security cyber security is not the 100% solution to any problem Very. ransomware happens how soon you can bring the business back up and running that's a skill and art 
most organizations need to learn if you ask me do we have that skill because actually the attack has never happened yet yeah. mm-hmm. will it happen will you able to restore the data at a point what is your rto coming from the bcp background mm-hmm. you know heading the bcp we have an rto rpo rpo says let's say rto says that two hours you need to recover the data but do you have a capability in the backups which will give you the data back in two hours so that's so i think uh, vendor risk management uh, is very very important coming from that perspective uh, selecting the right vendors and make business accountable so i think vendor risk management organization cannot success without having the right partners we cannot do everything on our own even in our case i can do maximum awareness set up a policy procedure but if i want to do a good implementation i need to rely on partners like you i need microsoft i need palo alto checkpoint Absolutely. i need sir every damn partner i needed yeah. because after your expertise in our work and we need to correlate and you know give it back to you know organization see sir always evolving changing and most of the things we have to handle but have a layered approach now we are following defense in depth couple of years maybe we have to go to the zero trust model that is what we mean. Yes. that's primary Absolutely. my feedback thanks so thanks shankar i think that uh, total ask Please. a question so Uh, you when you do vendor uh, audit sure. or vendor risk assessment sure. for all the vendors or no no uh, so uh, uh, sundar so we uh, we have something called material vendors right so four things we do it one is primarily if your data is getting shared with that vendor if customer pi data one part second is that if we are doing doing any major development for you let's say outsourcing or many let's say application development that is second part third is primarily if your application is integrated with them right they are consuming an apis or you know you are giving them you know uh, you know they are you are using their apis so because the infection happens there it will arise to your side and finally uh, uh, could be you know maybe data center or where your material you know things stored so in our case for example pn writer we we store our critical documents but again Mm-hmm. list may not be you know it gets changed over the period so so coming to you i think uh, maybe i will just uh, touch one more aspect of it especially when it comes to the partners ecosystem side of it one is uh, definitely the assessment part of it and identification of the risk but uh, if we look from the preventive part of it at the end of the day it is said that if you don't monitor a person there is no surety that uh, it will align to what is written in the document so from the preventive aspect like uh, how how do you look at uh, approaching the problem so i think you know as a vendor <clears throat> i takes responsibility in terms of storing their data and protecting their data right so uh, it is something like you know it depends upon what kind of data and what is the sensitivity of it which start from there so basic classification to determines what kind of control that i need to put suppose if i have a contract which is uh, to store uh, you know non sensitive kind of data i cannot put the same kind of control there and the data storage and the related kind of uh, human resource which is required that's also expensive for me right so here uh, our policy caters to all the category of data and the all the category of vendors so there is a commonality that we brought in and there is a distinguished uh, when there is a mechanism to distinguish kind of uh, data and the protection mechanism so the framework matters a lot right and uh, i also have my own vendors actually you know i i have certain outsourcing so i have to monitor them as well right mm-hmm. so that is coming to that uh, your question like uh, you know how do we uh, secure kind of ecosystem that we have so i consider the entire thing as my ecosystem right mm-hmm. so if i am giving my data to or make alliance data to a particular vendor i am responsible to pro- for the protection of it right so either they have to follow my policy and or or deploy my tools or they would convince me that the tools are robust enough and the policy is in line with my policy mm-hmm. right so we are very stringent in terms of entering into a contract with a particular vendor so our legal team actually spend lot of time and you uh, know before signing a particular contract with a vendor because ultimately it is my risk right True. i cannot say that okay this particular vendor i have given to this particular vendor and he has been breached now if he is breached then writer is breached right so that's the problem mm. so uh, primary aspect is uh, there are simple uh, kind of rules which has been followed 
one is we start from the data classification aspect of we have a uh, privacy framework uh, as well as the classification framework and we are very stringent in terms of doing that and uh, you know then the access aspect of it mostly we ensure that whatever be the uh, data we uh, were in transit or in rest or whatever all yeah. times it has to be encrypted right and in access control we ensure that there has to be a multi factor authentication for all kind of access and we strongly implement uh, role based access controls so we only provide what has been required to do that particular job to a particular employee not beyond that and that has been regularly audited because it changes after few times Correct. few few, few days it uh, actually it, it dilutes and there may be a client requirement you know or there may be a new regulations uh, which may be coming right now we are coming up with the the data privacy bill so we may have to comply with that right? it is not really the gdpr we have already complied with the gdpr but it's not really that now it's more important that we comply with the laws of the land very rather good. than the gdpr right exactly. so those kind of aspect we are very stringent and we are doing those kind of uh, things here yeah. makes sense and in fact rohit if you may allow you know before i come to the aspect maybe pravesh i would like to touch upon with you one question uh, you actually picked up uh, in continuation to the vendor side of it one very important aspect is how do you enforce contractually and that brings in the legal aspect of it so maybe i would request if you can share from the legal aspect i mean what are the things which you know a ciso should aware of because that's one area where it goes into greek and latin what do you do because ultimately say if i am dealing with x company i am not dealing with the company but i am dealing with a specific set of people if those set of people move from company a to company b are you going to change your vendor from x to y or a to b fantastic discussion and technical points contractual legal every sort of points uh, iso and everything we have discussed so far right so when it comes to uh, legal i would say that's the least of the topic i think we cisos have touched, touched upon at least i have not seen any of the ciso talking in law language or or uh, what the law which is applicable so i think the time has come we should get more into that space because uh, as i was reading some of the cisos were held legally liable in us or few of the other countries so india is always on the you know slower side but maybe we can have something like this very soon because certain requirements regulatory requirements they are really enforcing it very stringently so we can have uh, such a situation so i think it is very important for us to understand what are the law enforcement requirement if at all there is a case what kind of forensics or chain of custody what is admissible to the court of law right and if we understand that i think we should uh, work closely with a with a white collar practitioner to understand what what can what is the remedy and what is the safety net available to a ciso as a person if, because if person a ciso is liable or held responsible for any risk or any of the because the cases used to be like if you have heard a director of x company held because Uh, some misappropriation of funds has happened or some figures were not appropriately given to the regulator same is the case with ciso there is no difference you agree with uh, no parvesh uh, being a ciso or a cto we should be aligning with our regulatory uh, no requirements legal requirements also yes so we should understand now uh, likewise uh, indian government now they are actually approving a bill for data protection right that is a you know uh, no uh, it act 2000 will be replaced by this okay uh, means uh, it act 2000 will okay. be you know invalid and then a data protection bill will be you know active bill for all your personal data or pi data and then any any national data that is actually going outside of india or something that so there is a mechanism yes yes which covers the draft bill the draft bill crim so let let's say let's say no uh, give it a example to ourselves is that let's say you are in a business where legality is involved okay and you are dealing with the legal cases not only legal cases but but investigations as well 
okay yes investigations forensic forensic investigation and you have to submit your chain of custody so the io who who will do the investigation he is a, a local inspector he doesn't know anything about that okay and he will talk his in crpc con- con- language okay. right in having a stick on no, his head that, that is also changing that is also, that is also changing because changing. You, you have right you so have you cyber have stations have there now cyber right. crime on what basis ciso or cto can come under the legal purview because it is it is done by the approval of the management and management is duly appraised for pros and cons of the solution which we are proposing so you already gave the answer some time back that we speak a different language management speak a different language half of that is diluted when we get approvals right and a position itself held, hold you responsible for certain actions right what you have declared what you have approved or what you have presented so it is the position which is which is responsible although it was approved by the management to certain extent the position is responsible okay. for that sir the thing is that uh, what has been approved is it the residual risk which has been approved do you do you do they understand the residual risk right see it so is all documented is, ha see so then it is okay it is well documented and it is a, it is a approved at at that point in time of it course changes time right? context is always there yes so i think sir in the context of time i would say i think maybe you know i will come to rohit and of course i am a ciso for uh, pension fund right hdfc uh, pension management company uh, we have a very different uh, ball game altogether and the regulatory requirements i am also a deputy ciso for my uh, parent company which is hdfc life insurance right i have some examples i could relate a lot of things which i was saying because of that reason i work on both sides but let me give an example of pension right for pension i am a kmp right where i don't think so irda is also asking the ciso's to give some dedicated underwritings or confirmations to the regulatory saying that you have done 1 2 3 4 5 6 and tomorrow if something is not done as per what commitment you have given what we call as a compliance certificate the the ciso is responsible and that is why ciso has to be aware about two things if you are a service provider then what kind of service you are providing you have to ensure that uh, the client will ask indemnification for the services you are giving and tomorrow if your services fail then he should not be in court for that it is the vendor who should be but if you are on the other side where you are taking a service right uh, it's equally important for you uh, to safeguard yourself so knowing the uh, requirements security requirements that you should give when you're taking a service and when you're providing a service how do you ensure that you indemnify yourself it's nothing but that tomorrow something goes wrong let's say i'm giving service to him something goes wrong at his end i should not be pulled in a court of law it is you tomorrow if i am pen- or he is penalized that that penalty should not fall on to me he will indemnify me saying that okay it is a breach at his end so he will pay the complete penalty so i feel this basic understanding of what contract should be uh, and what is indemnification in pension fund we don't store in data but we collect lot of pii yes. because if you want to open an nps account you will come to me right and we onboard corporates now what happen when corporates get onboarded if it's an mnc they are also governed by their parent company laws right now what happens is there is a intermediary between which is called as the central record keeping agency so and you are we want to apply for a nps even as an individual you will log on to my website from there you will upload all your pii data onto crs portal where you will automatically redirect nothing is stored at my end now as a mnc corporate and as per the law of land where your parent company is there as an employee of that company you have a legal right where you can sue the parent company if your pii is compromised okay now if the government agency in between as a third party do i have any right on what cr it does no you know like in enterprises there has been a recent uh, huge influx of saas based applications you name the area starting from hr lead management hr management and so on and so forth there has been saas based solutions now however when you look from the regulator perspective regulator does not recognizes what is ias what is saas it says that whatever you are using it is you 
Now, continuing to the point that, okay, one remedy is you put an indemnification, but indemnification to the value of the contracts does not hold any value for you. So how do you handle this whole data flow with respect to SaaS and how do you bring in the controls? I will close with that and then we'll continue. Yeah, uh, actually uh, a very difficult question now after answering and hearing so many views. But uh, you're right, so SaaS is one of the uh, painstaking problem currently, which in fact I have been uh, dealing day in day out kind of thing. In fact, everyone would be dealing because with this digital adoption and so many, uh, in fact, in uh, securities market, the uh, so people have started adopting and following zero DAS and uh, others who are very flexible and agile in their adoptions. A similar problem is with us also. The SaaS uh, is one of the biggest issue. We try to classify uh, classify the vendor. So, so as a CISO, first, when it comes for an assessment with vendor risk or third party, because every SaaS has to be coming to us for a clearance kind of thing. Uh, and that is the way it has been handled. It's been balancing out, but uh, everyone would be uh, setting the priorities for the SaaS providers. With the closing comments from Sundar, I think I will hand it over to Ramya.